September 27th, Gospel and Scripture. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And the chief priests and scribes and elders argued with one another and said, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe John? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, I will not, but later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So in today's gospel, we have one of the more interesting scenes to me of Jesus in kind of in competition, in arguing, in conflict. You know, there's a lot going on there between Jesus and the people who are in the temple. I I think part of the thing that we struggle with in terms of how to understand this is the assumption that Jesus and the temple really didn't have a whole lot to do with each other. And, And it's the assumption that somehow, even though we know that Jesus grew up in the temple, you know, we remember the story of Mary and Joseph looking for Jesus and being unable to find him. And finally, they were able to find him in the temple you know, sitting at the feet of the rabbis and having discussions with them and and their exclamation that he had an unusual, you know, wisdom about him. And when they asked him why he was there, he said, well, where else would I be but in my father's house? You know, this idea that that Jesus and church didn't have a lot to do together, that's a myth. Jesus spent a lot of time in the temple. Or at the very least, the temple was some place where he was known to be, in a, known to be a, whether it's a member or whether it's like a visiting rabbi, or maybe those times when he was preaching in his hometown and then preaching in the temple, he was like a supply preacher because the regular rabbi was out that day. You know, we, we don't know exactly what went on, but we do know this, that Jesus had some sort of authority and place within the temple that allowed him to preach and allowed him to teach and allowed him to be there and function in the capacity of a rabbi or a pastor in a way that people didn't question him being there. Now, what people did question was the fact that his teaching was often at odds with the acceptable theology within that congregation or that temple. So this is the thing at the, at the center of it all today the, the chief priests and the scribes and elders were asking Jesus, by what authority are you teaching these things? And here's, here's the other thing about this, that we also assume, I think, well, maybe, maybe I assume, but I feel like it's part of our culture, that we, we kind of assume that, uh, you know, there was Jesus and there was the rabbis, and because we have this theological understanding that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus is fully man and fully God, we, we really enjoy looking at that nature of God within Jesus. We also sometimes forget about the human aspect of Jesus, that just as much as Jesus is God, Jesus is human. 
And the purpose for that, as we understand it, is so that we can see that God takes creation seriously enough, that God loves creation enough, that God loves us enough and desires strongly enough for us to recognize that not only does God have a care for us, but God has a stake in what happens to us through the incarnation of the Word made flesh. You know, this is no accident that we say fully God and fully human And so we forget sometimes about those human relationships. And I'm going to tell you a secret about what happens when pastors get together. We'll we'll just keep it between us. We fuss and we argue and we, like we get along. But, you know, there's a, it's, it's weird to call it competition. And it's not really most of the time conflict. But there, there is like this friendly dialogue where we, where we needle each other about theological issues. And it's, it's like any other profession in that regard. When, when you get together with other people who do what you do, you know, if you're an engineer and get together with other engineers, you're a teacher and you get together with other teachers, or you're a cook in a restaurant and you get together with other cooks, you're all going to share your tips and tricks and the things that work and the things that don't. And tell the other people, well, you're a little crazy for doing it this way because you could do it this way and all those other things. So, you know, we, we as pastors, when we get together, we do the exact same thing. We, we argue about theology. We, we talk about pastoral care. We talk about life as a pastor. And, you know, there's a, there is this kind of friendly push and pull. And there are moments when the push and pull becomes not so friendly because we're, we're having some deep division. You know, one, one such deep division is over human sexuality. You know, there still is argument about how to deal with the fact that there are people who are LGBTQIA+. And some of my, my colleagues left the ELCA over this. Some of us are very accepting of it and don't think of it as sin at all. We think of it as an expression of relationship. And wherever you sit in that camp, I'm going to tell you right now that there is a place at the table for all of us. The only time you're going to hear me feel get cranky about that is if I hear you say that there is no room at the table for somebody because there's, there's something wrong with their sin compared to your sin. I think that's a lot of times where we go wrong. And I think, too, this is part of what's at the heart of this budding conflict, but that by the time of Matthew 21 is not just budding, but it's full blown because the, the temple authority is already trying to figure out how to get rid of this guy. Because here he is preaching and teaching and telling people that what defiles you isn't what you put into your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth and telling people that whether you wash your hands or not, that's not what makes you clean by telling people that the Sabbath was created for human beings and the human beings weren't created for the Sabbath and doing work on the Sabbath that their traditions hold you're not supposed to. You know, it's like if somebody comes into one of the services and says, well, I know that you like to do this during the service, but that's not right. You know, you like to have instruments and Jesus didn't ever use an instrument, so we shouldn't use an instrument. Or... You know, something that that really is at the heart of what we believe. And somebody came in and, and disrupted the natural order of things. We may not crucify them, but we have our ways of making sure they recognize that they're not welcome. And we have ways to, culturally to deal with people who don't get the hint. You know, and that's part of our brokenness, too. It's also part of the reality that we... There, there is a culture that grows up in each congregation that sometimes people fit in well with and sometimes people don't. And uh, so, you know, by the time we get to Matthew 21, this, this conflict has been going and it's so deep that finally the, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes are done, you know, taking Jesus to the back room and asking him questions. They're just challenging him out in the middle of everyone. Well, well, who's a... Who gives you the right to say these things? And so Jesus throws him a curveball, and that's when he asks about John the Baptist. You know, by whose authority did John the Baptist do these things? And, and you know, this, this sidebar conversations, conversation that the, that the chief priests and elders had is so, so human. 
well, man, if we say that John the Baptist was a prophet, then he's going to ask us why we didn't listen. If we say that he's human and didn't have any divine authority, the people believe he's a prophet and they're going to be angry with us and we don't want our congregation mad. You know, that won't be good for the building fund. And, and so they hedged their bets and they said, well, we don't know. And, you know, there's a lot of situations where we hedge our bets, aren't there? You know, where, where we say, well, well, I don't know about those people. Like, they're probably okay, but I don't know that I can condone whatever it is they're doing. And, and so we say you can come, but you can't really be part of us. And even though in the Lutheran church, or at least this Lutheran congregation, we don't, really don't do that outright. There are those people who understand where they sit in relationship to the other people in the congregation. And when someone doesn't feel welcome, they know. And so Jesus tells another story, a parable that goes very well along with everything that he's been teaching so far, you know, about people who say one thing and do another. And it's interesting because both sons in this parable did that. They said one thing and did another. And, you know, we, we do appreciate when someone's predictable, you know, but one of them over-promised and under-delivered, and one of them under-promised and over-delivered. And we certainly have a lot more grace for the second one than we do the first one. And, and so I think what Jesus is trying to get at here is he's saying to the Pharisees something that I think sometimes we all need to hear. That if we only worship God with our lips, and all we do is say pretty prayers and sing pretty songs and come to church on Sunday because that's what good people do. And, you know, I say a prayer before the, before the meal and I put under God and the pledge and I do, you know, all these things that I do so that I can show that God is important to me. And all of those things have their own purpose and importance. But everything that I do makes a lie of those words. Do those words really mean anything at all? You know, that's, that's sometimes where we get the story of the, of the moral atheist, right? Where, where we have, or the, you know, the, the spiritual but not religious. Because people often see church people saying one thing and doing another in negative ways. They talk about love, but man, they sure don't know how to show it. And so we're going to go over here and do our thing. I think all of us have been on the receiving end of that kind of talk about love but not show it. I think all of us have been on the giving end of that talk about love but don't show it. And we know some some people who will never darken the door of a church and yet they seem to be good people. And they they seem to live out this calling that God has. And I, I think there's two things here that are important. One is that the thing that's most important to God is that our lives demonstrate the love that we have for God that's been placed into our heart by God's love for us. You know, our Jesus says multiple times throughout all four Gospels, you'll know somebody by their fruits. You know, an apple tree doesn't put out pecans. An apple tree puts out apples. And so if what somebody puts out smell sweet because of the words they use, but taste bitter because of what they put into it and their actions that follow. Their fruit is bitter no matter how sweet their words are. And even if someone is tough on the outside and their fruit is sweet, that person is sweet no matter what their outside is like. The gruff people who really have hearts of gold. And... So the Pharisees and the the temple people, they heard this and they knew what Jesus was saying. You sing your songs and you say your prayers and you do your oblations and you wash your hands and you fast on the appropriate days and you say all the right words and, and you do all the right things to engage the trappings of holiness and religiosity. But your religiosity doesn't have any soul. It doesn't have any heart. It's bone with no meat. It's an empty vessel. No wonder they wanted to kill Jesus. 
No wonder they wanted this guy to be gone. No wonder, because when we hear words like that from people who we know, and maybe we don't like real well, but we respect them because we know there's something to them, it does hurt to be laid bare in, in a way that's so public and so profound. But like those temple folks, sometimes we put somebody in a position where there's not a lot of choice but to do it. So what do we do with this? I, I am not trying to lay this out as a, uh, as a thou shalt not sermon. What I'm, what I'm trying to lay out is this, that even if we don't want to, and even if we swear we're not going to do it, there are moments where we recognize what the right and important thing to do is. And in those moments, our actions should not match our words, under promise but over deliver. And there are moments where we feel compelled to say that we're going to do something, and that, but we really have no intention of doing it. We'd be better off just saying no in the first place rather than making liars out of ourselves. And for those of us who are pleasers and want people to be happy with us, that is a hard lesson that's continuing and we usually have to learn time and time again because it feels better to say yes than no. And, and so in, in our lives, the way we put wheels on this thing and put it into action is this. Do something that I'm not real good at, and this is something I'm going to do this week. Think through the things that you agree to do, and think whether it's really something that you're going to do. And practice saying no when you have to. Practice saying yes and meaning it. And, and more, think about the reasons that we do this. Not because we're worried that God's going to punish us if we don't, but because the love with which God loves us sows love in our hearts. And by sharing the love that God puts inside of us, that love grows. And I think the reasons that the, the people in the temple got so upset about this and questioned the authority is it's hard to imagine life being different when life is working for you. And the reason that the tax collectors and the prostitutes get there first is because they're the ones who listen, because how can life get any worse? And it's not like the people in the temple are going to let them in. So this week, be like the tax collector and the prostitute, and listen like you don't have anything left to lose. And look for the value in the people around you who, this, who the culture tells you don't have any worth, and discover what it looks like to love like God loves. Amen.